So surprise, something really cool just happened. You guys know Verilog. You can actually write a, a state machine. You can write most of what you need to do when you're writing RTL. Let's see an example of how we can do this. We can draw a state machine and we have a one-to-one -one mapping of the state machine to Verilog code. Very simple. If you can do that, well, you became, you've just become a digital designer. So let's start, uh, start a state machine example and it'll be a four bit counter. Our four bit counter has four inputs. It has the system clock called clock. It has a low reset. This time we call it reset underscore N. It has an activate signal, which is kind of an enable. It says if we're going to count or just do nothing. And it has another signal that says if we're going to count up or down. So if up is up, if this up down N is one, then we're going to count up. If it's zero, we're going to count down. Okay. It has two output signals. One of them is count. It's a bus that tells what the value of the current count is. And one of them is overflow. It says if we passed 11111 or we went below 0000, we overflew. So just taking that as our interface, we will define our header. So we call the module SM for state machine. Okay. And we have our port list, clock, reset, end, act, up, down, count, and overflow. We also added this other thing. Look, this is not a delay. It's a parameter declaration. Okay. What we're going to do here is we're going to declare a parameter called counter with, and we're going to say its default value is four. So this is the default value. However, we can see afterwards in our test bench, when we instantiate this module, we can override this default value. But right now we're going to write our code as parameterizable as possible. So um, we can make this work for different counter sizes. By default, we'll start with a four bit counter. Okay. Then we have all of our inputs, clock, reset, act, up, down, end. And I put them on separate lines. I could have separated each uh, one bit um, signal with a comma, but uh, it's better to put them on separate lines because then we can kind of see them. We can add um, some sort of a, a comment here like system clock or something like that. And that gives us a better and more readable code. Okay. And then we have our output. Our output is this count. And the count is parameterizable the size of it. So if it's four bits, that means we have to have it three to zero. So that's counter width minus one to zero. That is equal to three to zero in this case. But as I said, we can override that and make it a thousand to zero, right? Um, and then we have our, uh, we have, uh, this is a mistake here, sorry. Output overflow. We have our output called overflow and we also declare that as a reg. We could have written output reg overflow and it would also work. And then we have, uh, uh, we also, describe count as a reg and we have a state and next state um, as four bit vectors and we'll see in a second why. So let's draw the state machine here. Okay, we start with one state called idle and when we hit the reset button, we go back to our idle state. Then if we stay with our uh, activate signal at zero, we will just stay inside our idle state and not do anything. What happens afterwards? If our activate equals one, then we have to check. If we're counting up, if up down is one, then we go to a state called count up. If up down is zero, we'll go to a state called count down. In this state, we will increment our counter. In this state, we will decrement our counter. Now, if act goes low on the next clock cycle, we'll go back to idle and not change anything. And then if act goes high again, we'll either count up or count down. Okay. Next, if we stay with act equals one and we have uh, up down equals one, we'll count up again. Or if we are, have act stays high and we have an up down stays low, we'll stay in this state. On the other hand, if up down changed, we have to cross between the states that we were at. Now, one last thing, there's an overflow condition. And if we reach the overflow condition, we'll go to a state called overflow and we'll get stuck there forevermore. Plus, our output called overflow will go high. So this is our state machine of our counter. And now we'll see how we encode this into Verilog very straightforwardly. First of all, we have these different states. And uh, since there are, two st there are four states, we can use just a 
um, two-bit vector to describe all four states but what we should do is we should enumerate them we should give them names so we don't call them one two three four but rather call them idle count up count down and overflow what we use is we use something called a local param we could also use a parameter we could also use a, a tag define but it, the best uh, practice is to use a local param we say this word idle is actually uh, a state and what we decided is an encoding called one hot there are different ways to encode state machines we decided on the one hot encoding so for each state we need a, a, a bit um, and we called idle 0001 count up 0010 etc okay so we'll be using these words in our code it makes it much more readable next we go into writing the combinational block what we have is if you remember we declared two um, registers state and next state um, both of them were uh, four bits and four bits because we have the four states that are one hot encoded okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to have completely combinational logic that will compute what the next state of our system should be once the clock um, rises okay so how do we do that it's a combinational block so we do use always at star and we actually don't care what's in the sensitivity list because this star will decide by itself then we start with a case and we want to know what the current state is so it's case state and depending on the state, we'll do different things that will exactly describe our state machine. So let's start with the state idle. What do we know about idle? If act is zero, we're gonna stay in idle. If act is one, then depending on up down, we're either gonna go to count up or count down. So we ask if act, if act is one, if not, it's easy, we're gonna stay at zero. But if it was one, then we look at the state of up down. So we say if up down is high, then we're going to do this path and we're going to uh, be in the count. The next state is going to be the count up state else. The next state is the countdown state. So we have completely described all of the arrows pointing out of this idle state. Next, we can go over to the count up. It's a bit more complicated. What do we have in the count up? We have this arrow. When act goes to zero, we will idle when act stays at one and up down stays at one will stay in count up and when act stays at one but countdown goes down we'll go to countdown um, on the other hand we have this arrow that when there is the overflow condition we have to go into overflow okay so first we have this big if else right that if act then we go into this block of code if not we go next state into idle that was um, basically this arrow okay if act is high though we go into our uh, uh, our code block here okay so then we ask the situation of up down if up down so now up down is one that means we're going to be counting up here we can look at our overflow um, uh, overflow condition when do we overflow when we have a situation when we have uh, say we're a four bit counter if it's one 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 and we want to go up our next state will be an overflow so how do we actually describe that uh, with a parameter? Hmm, it's tough because we don't uh, we don't know what our state. We can't uh, say if count equals one 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 one, and if we had a five bit counter, it wouldn't be sufficient. So we play a little trick. Okay, we take we do this. We take one one is zero 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 one. Okay, and there would be a whole bunch more zeros if we had a longer if counter width was higher than four, and then we shift it left by counter width. So we go one two three four and we get the uh, number one zero 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 that's five bits right five bits okay guess what if we remove one from there minus one we get one 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 okay if that's what then that's what we wanted and that works for any bit width so we are our condition over here to get to the overflow state is if count equals one shifted left by counter with minus one. It's a little kind of trick that digital designers have developed over the years. Okay, so if that happens, our next state is obviously overflow. If not, then our next state stays at count up. Else, okay, if count is zero, then the next state is overflow else the next state is countdown so if we were here i don't know how we'd be here with count zero but if we were then uh we would overflow if we would go um 
if we were going uh, to try and count down from zero. Um, so that's basically our description of count up. Our description of countdown is exactly the same, just uh, we kind of change the conditions. Um, if you saw before, I wrote for uh, b0, but we actually wanted a, a variable width. We could have written counter width b0, or we could just leave it empty, and Verilog will uh, use this as an extendable zero. We could have also just written zero, and it would have been fine. Finally, we have our um, overflow state. And in our overflow state, we want to stay always in our overflow state. So in case overflow, next state will be overflow. Finally, as I told you, we have to always put a default condition on, uh, on our case statements. That's just in case for some reason there was some glitch or we made some mistake and we got to a, a state that we shouldn't have been at. In that case, we want to show that there's an error in our simulation. So we say, first of all, our next state is in X. Okay. And second of all, we write some sort of a uh, of an error message on our log file. So that is our combinational um, description. But how do we actually move between the states? And it's really easy. We have a sequential block. Okay. So the sequential block is really simple, and you'll see this almost exactly like this in every state machine. Always at pause edge clock or negage reset. If not reset, state equals idle. That described this error here. If reset goes low, then we go into the idle state. Else, state gets next state. And you see this is a non-blocking assignment because it's in a sequential block. So every time the, the, um, the uh, clock goes high, state goes to next state. We tra traverse between these guys, okay? It actually made a bus of flip-flops. They're the state flip-flops. There is a signal coming in, or a bus of signals called next state. And when the clock rises, next state turns into state. And this goes back into our combinational logic that figures out what the next state is. And that is how we made our uh, state machine. We have one more thing that is uh, synchronous, which is this count. So every time that we're in count up, we're going to increment our counter. Every time we're in count down, we're going to decrement our counter. So always at pause edge clock or negage reset, we have this asynchronous reset that will um, uh, put our counter back at zero. But if state equals count up, we're going to increment our counter. If state equals count down, we're going to decrement our counter. And basically, we're almost finished now. One thing is left is this overflow signal. In all these three states, I didn't draw it on the picture, overflow is zero. Only in the overflow state, overflow gets one. That's purely combinational. It, it, it's dependent only on the state, and it doesn't uh, uh, depend on the clock. So in a, in a more machine, we're going to output assign overflow equals if state equals overflow, then output a one, else output a zero. And that's it. We hardwired the... Um, condition for a one output on our overflow. Now we'll write a test bench for our state machine. So module state machine test bench. We give some sort of a parameter and we call it width. And this will be the width of our counter. And but it's the width at the state machine level, at the test bench level, not at the device under test level. And we decided we'll instantiate a 5-bit counter, not a 4-bit counter, which was our default for our state machine. We have regs for all of our signals that we'll be inputting to, the, uh, uh, to our uh, device under test. And we have wires for the outputs from the device under test. Remember, we cannot connect an instantiated block to an output uh, reg. So... We'll instantiate the machine. We write SM, that's the name of the module, not this module, the module we described above. We called it DUT, but we passed a parameter called width. So that will override the default parameter, which was 4, and it will make a 5-bit counter. DUT will be a 5-bit counter and not the default 4. And then we have the dot notation, which connects all of our signals that we just declared here to our signals, uh, to our ports of the module. It was very convenient to just give them the same names. Um, and that's something we'll often do, especially if there's only a single instantiation of, the, of that module inside our higher level hierarchy. Okay, now 
we'll start our simulation. We should initialize the different values. We'll start clock high. We'll start reset low. Um, we'll start activate low and we'll start up down high. It didn't really matter how we would start these. We have to reset and uh, release the reset. Okay, and we'll put some system tasks. We'll monitor the different uh, um, signals here and we'll have them print out on screen. And then we'll have a delay. Remember this, uh, uh, this is a delay. So we'll delay 100 time units. And after 100 time units, we'll release our reset by raising it to one. We have to define a clock. So we saw that's pretty easy. We'll just do always every five time units clock gets negative clock. And now we'll start our, uh, our stimuli. Okay, what are our stimuli? Um, at 100, because up till 100 we were in reset, we'll start counting up until we hit overflow. So we have a delay by 100 because uh, the first 100, it didn't really matter what we were doing because we were under reset. Okay, at time step 100, we'll raise our activate signal and we'll start with our up down signal being high. That's a count up. We'll count up for a long time. For how long? A thousand cycle, a, th a thousand time units at a clock period of ten. That's a hundred cycles. Since our counter was only five bit, it will uh, very soon saturate and overflow. Okay. So what we should see in our test bench is we hit an overflow. And if you take this uh, code and run it in a simulator, that's what you will see. Um, after a thousand cycles, we can reset our um, our design. Wait a hundred cycles. Uh, 100 time units we didn't need to wait that long but we did and then we will release the reset now um, we are activate uh, uh, we'll have to go high and our up down is supposed to go so we started counting up high here and then for four for four cycles we counted up high so we got to four and then turned up down to low and started started counting low forever more until it actually saturated uh, basically 40 time units or four cycles later. So that's a way we basically tested almost all of our signals or hopefully all of our signals and all of our states in our state machine. That is called a directed test. It is not a uh, formal verification and it's not even a good type of a verification, but it's what we want to just do to test that at least our basic functionality works. As I promised, we're going to have a, a short break in the middle of each lecture to discuss the IEEE uh, Chip Hall of Fame and bring different types of chips that are famous from the past. And here's a kind of a personal chip. Um, we started with the Intel 4004, which was the original microprocessor or Intel's first microprocessor. But Intel really broke out with the, eight, uh, the 8088 microprocessor. And here you can see a picture of it here. You can see it's a bit big. It had a bit more pins and so forth than the 4004. Uh, it's a later uh, version of their uh, the Intel microprocessor. And the reason that it became so successful, and the reason that it's such a famous chip, is because IBM selected this chip to put it in their PC, um, their personal computer, which brought the computer into our homes and is the best-selling computer of all time. And it was based on this Intel 88 processor. Um, it was released in July 1979. It had 29,000 transistors. If you remember from the last lecture, the uh, 4004 only had 2,300 transistors. So that's already an order of magnitude higher. It ran at a 10 megahertz frequency versus a, a, a few hundred kilohertz for the um, 4004. It was in a 3 micron CMOS process versus a 10 micron PMOS process for the 4004. And it had a 16 bit 8x86 architecture, but actually it had an 8 bit output bus. So, first of all, this x86 architecture may look familiar to some of you because it's, a, it's the architecture that is still used today in Intel and AMD machines. And it's one of the two leading architectures in the world, along with the ARM architecture. And it became famous because of this IBM PC and because of this 8088 uh, microprocessor. But it's very interesting because the, the better chip that they put out was the earlier 8086, and that's why it's the x86 architecture, because this is the architecture that was built for the 8086. Um, but there was a problem that the, they wanted to make the IBM PC a cheap computer, and most of the other chips around worked on an 8-bit bus. So they had to take the 8086, which was 16 bits, and remove um, the, the external 8-bit uh, uh, outputs. Um, so what did they do? They sent it up here to Israel, to the young Intel team in Haifa, and uh, they asked a, a guy who I happen to know to castrate 
the 8086, and a few months later he came out with this uh, 8088, which was not as good a chip as 8086, but it was the big success. So, I know something that maybe Gordon Moore and the other Intel management doesn't know about this chip, because I know the guy who designed it. Well, do you see something strange about this chip? Um, let's take a zoom in on this top right corner. And I don't know how many of you know Hebrew, but I guess Intel didn't, and they weren't able to erase this. But here it says the Reish Pe Yud, which is Rafi. And that is the name of a guy named Rafi Retter, who was the designer of this chip. And Rafi told me that Intel uh, wasn't allowing the designers to write their names on the chips, and they were erasing them. But doing it in Hebrew, the, the management didn't, uh, didn't see that he wrote his name on it, and that's how it was taped out and sold to the whole world.